reward cards. There we go. Everywhere I go lately, it seems I've been asked for reward cards. You know, if you spend more, you earn more. And I think when we come to the presence of God, it sometimes feels like, God, what am I bringing to this relationship? This is one of the most beautiful things that it's not about what we bring or what we earn. It's called unmerited grace, unmerited favor. Now we just come with nothing. We actually come with a deficit. We come with brokenness and shame and, and sinfulness and God brings blessing, reward to our life. And because of what he does for us, then we return to him an offering and a sacrifice of praise. This morning, I just wonder, right where you are, would you just begin to thank God for what he's done in your life? Right where you are, begin to thank him for what he's done, who he's brought, what he's, what he's healed in you, what he's provided for you, what he, he's changed and transformed in you and your family. Just begin to speak specifically, God, I thank you for what you've done in my kids and what you've done in my family, God, for how you've redeemed me from where I was to where I am right now. Just begin to declare with specificity of uh, what God has done for you. So Jesus, we thank you. God, that as we come to you, we're not as a reward for who we are, a reward for who we've been, and we're not punished for who we are or what we've been. Lord God, that you simply all invite us to the foot of the cross to receive your unmerited favor and grace. And Lord, as a result of that, Lord, we are all on even ground. Lord, we are all at this place of saying, great are you, Lord. For when I was lost and when I was broken, when I had nothing to offer, you came and you redeemed me, you restored me, you healed me, you delivered me, and you blessed me day by day. So God, in this place of worship this morning, I pray, Lord, that we would just be so grateful for your blessing. So grateful for your provision, grateful for who you are. Lord, for those of us in need of a touch from you today. Lord God, I just think of Gary Graham yesterday. I heard that he had a heart attack this weekend. Lord, I thank you for that he's in a good place and getting ready to have a stint. Lord, we pray, Lord Jesus, for a blessing on his life. Be, be with dear dear God. Bring her peace. Uh, Lord, comfort her heart and her anxious mind, Lord God, we pray. Lord, we just uh, pray for Don Schneider, God. We pray that you continue to uh, uh, give him courage as he grieves, Lord. I think of my, my new friend Dennis in the hospital, Lord, healing, Lord, and for many others, Lord, who are in need of a touch from you, God. I pray, Lord, for your provision and your gracious hand to be extended. And to the rest of us in this place, God, you know the prayers of our hearts, Lord, the desires of our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would come and you would respond to them, Lord. I pray as we open your word this morning, Lord, that you would encourage our hearts, challenge our minds, we pray. Make us more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. High five the person beside you this morning. Tell them you're so great, glad to be beside them. It's so good to be in church. How many are glad to be in church this morning? All right. I want to ask you this question. Have you ever felt like you've been stretched to your limit? You ever felt like that, that you were at the edge of what you could handle? Now, I got to be honest, this uh, past few weeks, like, it's gorgeous. I can see the sun shining out there. I feel like I've been on a roller coaster of weather emotions, right? I feel there's been a few days where I'm like, I can't wait for summer. You know, the sun's been peeking out. You see the blue sky. You're like, it's here. And then yesterday, like, snow. What's up with that? Right? I'm just kind of like, it's like the yo-yo of emotion, but I, I can't wait for summer. One of my family's favorite summer pastimes is being out on the lake. How many like to be out on the lake? You're a beach person, lake person. We love to be out on the lake, and uh, one of our favorite pastimes is tubing behind a boat. Who's ever tubed behind a boat before? Anyone? Okay, there's a few more people on this service. You wouldn't believe how many people in the first service have never been behind a boat. Where's all the people you've never been on a tube behind a boat? Anybody? All right. Well, when you're tubing, the driver of the boat has one mission. And the mission is to knock you off the tube. That's his only goal in life is to go as fast as he can and get your boat, you, you get some whips in there, you get the tube, you know, cutting across the wake. And uh, it can be a lot of fun. 
A person on a tube only has one objective, and that's to stay on for as long as you can. And so it's a lot of fun. And uh, you know what? Pastor Holly, she looks so angelic up here, you know, leading worship. But let me tell you, you get her on the back of a boat on a tube, and she turns into another person. She's a beast out on that tube. And I don't know what it is. I think it's because she's the baby of her family. She's the, she has youngest child syndrome. And so she just thinks, like, the whole tube is hers. Like, she doesn't care, you know, if you're sharing the tube. Like, she's taking all the two, hogging the tube. And you know, when you're, when you're getting ready to be whipped across, if you've, you know, you kind of get used to it, you start leaning into the curves a little bit. And she gets her knees up there and she's like pushing you off the tube so that she can, you know, and that's how she is. And she's been known when we get two tubes out there, we get two tubes coming together and she'll give your tube a kick and send you flying. That's just who Pastor Holly is, <laughs> just so you know. I mean, and I'm jailing on Sundays, but on the boat, I'm telling you, different. And I think it's genetic. It's hereditary. Because her dad, some of you got to know Paul right here. Paul has been trying to knock us off the tube for just about as long as I can remember. Now, a little secret, Paul doesn't swim. I don't know if he cares if I tell you that. So he's always been the driver as long as I've been around the family. And uh, so he's always been speeding and whipping us across the lake. And I remember a specific instance. Uh, you know, he's, he sent us flying. Uh, I remember one time he hit a wake so hard that he knocked me right out of my wedding ring. And my ring got lost in the lake. I remember. But the one I remember the most, the specific time, is that before Holly and I were dating. And, uh, and so he, you know, it's picture, he has fatherly duties, and I have aspirations, right? I'm trying to, you know, why, why is this young buck hanging around my house, right? Uh, what is it that he's trying to accomplish? And so we were out on the lake, and so we both knew what was happening. He knew that he had to send a message to this young guy coming around, hanging out with his daughter. And on the tube, I knew that I was going to be the recipient of a lesson, all right? And so I hung on to the tube as hard as I could, and I grabbed hold of those handles, and I, I'm not being fancy. I actually, I broke my finger yesterday, so it doesn't bend. So that's why, but, you know, so I'm like holding on as hard as I could on the tube, and he just let it rip. He hit the throttle, and the boat took off down the lake, and I was holding on for dear life, and I think we both won, because the next thing I knew, the boat was gone down the lake, and I was sitting in the water with two handles in my hands, just kind of wondering what had happened. And so it's a lot of fun. Whips are fun. When you know you're coming, you brace yourself for them, right? You kind of lean. If you've ever been on the tube, you kind of lock your arms sometimes. You try to lean into the, the whip and the centrifugal forces and the speed are all working against you staying on the tube. Now, this is what I've discovered when people go tubing for the first time. I should make it my goal to get as many people from our church on the tube as possible. You know, maybe that would be my, my second calling in life. I don't know. Right, but this is what I've discovered. Either you, people, they go for a whip and they go, that was awesome, let's do it again, right? Where's all those people at? Where's all the awesome, let's do it again people, right? And then the other response is, that was crazy, I've had enough, right? Where's all those people, right? Like, that, that was enough for me, okay. Well, I feel like life can be a lot like tubing. Like there's a moments where you're enjoying the action. Like you're looking forward to what life is bringing you. You know, there's other moments where we just feel tired of hanging on. We just kind of want like a season uh, of chill. We want just a smooth ride. But then there are these moments where it seems like the speed picks up and you start getting thrown back and forth. You're out to the outer edges of what you feel like you can handle. Have you ever been there where you felt like you were on the edge, uh, on the edge of your strength? Maybe you felt like you were on the edge of your courage, or even if we were to admit it, on the edge of your faith. I don't know if I could take much more. Much like tubing, whips in life, uh, send the, they have this way of disorienting us, uh, of leaving us breathless and even in pain sometimes, like when you've been knocked out of your wedding ring. See, I think that we can respond in one of two ways. We can respond that we've had enough, or we can regroup and say, let's go again. As we look at Romans chapter 8, it summarizes life's uncertainty this way. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity, or are persecuted or hungry or destitute, or in danger or threatened with death? No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. 
Friends, the reality of this world that we live in and the reality of our lives is that there are very real and tangible effects of evil and sin all around us. The Bible is clear that there is a real enemy of your soul. There is a real enemy whose desire to distract and detract from what God wants to do in your life, to dissuade you from worshiping God and to discourage you from the plans and purposes that God has for your life. There is a spiritual enemy. Satan is real. The Bible talks about it clearly. But the Bible is also clear that there are consequences to sin. And sin is basically just living outside the intention and the boundaries that God sets for us. Sometimes those effects spill into our lives, even when it's the result of other people's sin. Even when we're living like we should, sometimes the effect of other people's uh, sins spill into our lives. And yet, in spite of these realities, we can still confidently declare overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. See, we can be overcome by our circumstances or we can be overcomers. Revelations 12, 7, uh, 10 says this, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and that they did not love their lives to the death. See, as we look at these two passages, Romans and Revelation, we read it's through Christ. And it's by the blood of the Lamb. Our overcoming is first established in what Christ has done. It's about what Jesus has done for us. See, this Revelation passage is describing the end of the world. It's talking about the culmination of this age, the final chapter of earth as we know it. And scripture has been pointing to this day all along. It says when evil and sin and death, when disease and brokenness, when hurt and pain have all been erased. I love the Bible talks about every tear will be wiped from our eyes. When God's kingdom in all its perfection is established in totality. We talk about the already but not yet. The kingdom of God, Jesus established the kingdom of God and it's in progress. It's a kingdom in progress, but we see one day soon that Jesus will bring it to completion. And so the message of truth and the message of hope, see the message that picks us up when we've been knocked down, the message that encourages us when we've been discouraged, the message that keeps us going when life throws us for a whip, is that Jesus overcame so we can overcome. Would you say that with me? Would you say Jesus overcame overcame. so we can overcome? overcome. Tell the person beside you, tell them they need to hear it this morning. Jesus overcame overcame. so we can overcome. Well, we're starting our new Easter series, and this is the theme of our series. You're going to get tired of that verse, I'm sure, by the end of it. Or it's going to get in there, and it's going to become such a conviction of your life. Jesus overcame so that we can overcome. I love a good movie. Anyone love a good movie? I love a movie that starts out strong. Like the ones that you're just kind of like waiting for it to pick up. You know, you're the ones you go to with your wife. You're like, like, this is kind of, right? Like I like the ones where it's like opening scene, action. Well, what's happening here? You know, cars and all that. You know, I love it. Where you just come in. And one of the ways directors pull us into a movie is they, they show the ending. And you're wondering, how do we end up in this situation? How did we get here, right? And then they go back to the beginning and they tell the story of how we ended up in that place. And as we look at these scriptures, we're looking at the victory of Romans chapter 8 and the overcoming of Revelation 12. And over the next few weeks, we're going to go back and we're going to look at the story of Easter and some of the different scenes of the days leading up to that day. And we're going to look at what brought us to this place of victory and overwhelming. Jesus overcame so we can overcome. If you want to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 15, and then we'll go over to 16 as well. We have a red letter Bible. Uh, that's basically just all the words of Jesus in red. You'll find that we're right in the middle of a really thick red spot. Jesus has been doing a lot of talking and teaching in this passage. And, and for context, what we're finding ourselves in the middle of the, we're in the middle of the Last Supper. If you're familiar with that story, Jesus has already washed the disciples' feet. 
He's already insinuated to his followers that he's aware that one of them will betray him. Judas has already left the room to initiate his part of the plan of betrayal. Peter has already declared his allegiance to Jesus. Jesus, no matter what, I got you. And Jesus has already looked at Peter and said, three times you're going to deny me. You're well-intentioned, but you're not going to live up to your promise. So Jesus has tried to explain to his followers that he was going to return to their father and that he would send them another helper, an advocate, the Holy Spirit, like we've been talking about the last few weeks. So we're in the midst of this whole conversation and knowing that this would be some of his last instructions, Jesus has carefully thought out his words and he wants to ready his disciples for what is to come. John 15 verse 18 says this, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you're no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. And since they persecuted me, naturally, they will persecute you. Moving on to John 16, 1, Jesus reveals his intention. What was his thought? What was his motive behind sharing this with his followers? He says, I have told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith. Jesus said, there's some things I want you to know because it's going to be important to you maintaining your faith. Unmet expectation is the root of disappointment. You ever experienced that to be true? Right? You ever gone into something with an expectation to be disappointed, right? And you go into a movie and it's not as good as you had hoped it would be. It's, you, you have disappointment, right? Maybe the, all the new hype around a certain restaurant and you go to try it out. You're like, it's not as good as I thought it was going to be. The higher your expectation, the greater your uh, risk of disappointment, right? And so when things don't go the way we expected, we're often less wondering what went wrong. What went wrong? Why were my expectations not met? Right? You might ask yourself, what could I have done differently? Maybe you have asked this question, why is this happening to me? There must be some kind of mistake, right? There's a reason that this isn't going according to plan. And so Jesus is preparing his disciples for what's to come, and he wants them to be prepared with the expectation that things are going to get difficult. Following Jesus isn't an easy path. It's not a bed of roses, so to speak, right? And we see here that there will be suffering and hardship involved. Jesus uses this phrase, the world. John, he records Jesus saying this, but John uses the world. The, world, the Greek is cosmos. He uses it more than half of all that's appearances in Scripture, he talks about the world a lot. But when he's, whenever he's referring to the world, he's never talking about the earth or the globe that we live on. Uh, he's never talking about, you know, the planet earth. What he's talking about as an order or a system uh, that is under the influence of Satan and sin. It's an order and a system that's in opposition to the kingdom of God. We have the kingdom of God and we have this world. The world is shown to persecute and pressure the people of God to conform to the ways of the world and not to be outliers. So Jesus is saying, don't be alarmed. Don't be uh, you know, confused when you find yourself living in this tension. But then he says this. He says, but I have overcome the world. Jesus overcame so that we can overcome. 1 John 5 says, every child of God defeats this evil world. And we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. The Bible says that you will either be overcome or you'll be an overcomer. Jesus said, I told you all of these things so that you won't abandon your faith. Now, if we were to skip down past uh, uh, John 16 to verse 33, he says this. I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you'll have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. See, as Jesus is wrapping up this Passover meal, and he's sharing this moment with his disciples, you know, along with all his other preparatory instruction that he's given them, he wants them to have this simple fact ringing in their minds. You will face hardship. 
but you can overcome. You know, there's so many moments in our lives today that we are faced with hardship. And so I want to look at three elements to what Jesus is saying here to give us hope and to give us courage today. Three truths that will help us overcome hardship. The first one is this, that we can have peace. We might say it this way, it's okay not to be okay. There's a song by Demi Lovato that says, it's okay not to be okay. You know, we hear that in social media, especially with all the talk about emotional and mental health and, and trying to end, end the stigma of needing, uh, you know, help to encourage people to reach out. But Jesus wants us to know that it's okay not to be okay. It's okay when things are going poorly. You know, we often interpret the presence of difficulty and hardship in our life as a signal that something's gone awry. You know, that something is, is not right. We, we look at when things are, when we're facing hardship as a statement about ourselves, don't we? Right? We think, what have I done? I must have done something wrong. I, I must have made a mistake or somehow I'm being punished, right? We can think like that when things are going wrong and we're facing hardship. We think about it's a statement about us. Or we think it's a statement about God. We think, well, somehow God has failed us. But Jesus is saying here, it's okay when things aren't okay. He says there will be hardships. He says expect them. But don't let them cause you to abandon your faith. We love a good explanation, don't we? Right? When something's going wrong, you know, all of us parents, right, we, we ask, like, you better have a good explanation for this, right? Have you ever had your parent ask you that? You know, you better have a good reason. We love a good explanation. And when hardship shows up in our life, if, there's any, if you're like me, you know, maybe you ask some form of this question of, like, like why is this happening to me, right? What did I do to d- deserve this? We all have this need to understand what is happening to us and why it's happening to us. And this is especially true when our hardship leads to suffering, right? This is especially true when we experience loss. Our heart cries out for a reason for the pain. You know, when our suffering seems pointless, it can lead to bitterness, hopelessness, even loss of faith. And so we wrestle. We wrestle with the fact that we can't always find a reason for what we're going through. But I've learned sometimes we just need to resign ourselves to Proverbs 20, 24, which says the Lord directs our steps. So why try to understand everything along the way? See, how we answer this why of hardship depends on how we interpret its meaning and potential in our lives. I think every hardship we, we go through originates in one of four places. Every hardship can be traced back to one of four places. The first place is you. How many of us sometimes you make decisions and you take actions for things that bring hardship to your life? Right? Anyone? Like, I've done some things that have created hardship for myself. And you endure it. We also see in Scripture that there is the world, that we are persecuted for, uh, and the world opposes the principles of God. When you're living for godly principles, the world is in opposition to you. Jesus said, don't be surprised that the world hates you. It first hated me because I was stood out against it. Don't be an outlier. Don't be going contrary to the ways of the world. We also see that Satan has plan and purpose for our life, and he's opposed to the purposes of God. Bible says that the thief comes to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. So there is such a thing as spiritual warfare. In the North American church, I think we either uh, attribute everything to, you know, the spiritual warfare, or we attribute nothing to spiritual warfare, right? I don't think it's as prevalent as some people make it seem, but some of us are oblivious to the fact that there is a spiritual battle going on around us. It's true. And then some of the hardships... Originate with God. Now that sounds weird because, you know, I don't think that God, you know, puts us in positions necessarily. Uh, but what we see in Scripture that sometimes God shakes up our life. Sometimes God needs to change the course of our direction or to get our attention. And so sometimes when we are running from God, he, we, we face hardship. But the reassuring truth about hardship is that regardless of its origin, 
Scripture promises that God will cause everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Now notice that it doesn't say that God causes all things. Often it's us. Most of my hardship originates with me. Some of my hardship originates with the world. A small portion of it probably originates in spiritual warfare. And sometimes it's God trying to get my attention. But regardless of the source, God causes all things to work out for our good. The things we've brought on ourselves, the product of the world we live in, the straight up spiritual attacks, the hardship that God brings us for correction. Hebrews 12, 4 says the Lord disciplines those he loves. He's trying to bring us into this place of relationship and strengthen him. But we may not understand why hardship comes our way, but we can determine how we allow it to affect us. James 1 uh, famously says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Consider an opportunity for great joy. Some of you are going through some stuff right now, and you just got to say, this is an opportunity for great joy. I don't know how, but it is. He says, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. See, when we're done asking, why is this happening to me, and what did I do to deserve this, we kind of get to the real quality questions. The more productive questions. The question of what can I learn from this? How can I grow through what I'm going through? How do you grow stronger? I know a bunch of you guys just got gym memberships. You're at the gym. I know it, right? Caden, I can see it already on you, right? How do, how do you grow, right? You grow through resistance training, right? The heavier the weight, the more resistance, the more your muscles are building. It's the same with our faith. We build faith and character and endurance through resistance. We wish it could be another way. How many wish that we could grow our muscles from sitting at our desk all day? We wish it's true, right? Some of us, we need some resistance in our lives to help us grow physically. God says we can grow spiritually. How do you grow as a person? Through adversity, I remember a few years ago, I had a student in my youth ministry when I was a youth pastor, and, and uh, he had gone to university, and he was going into the NBA draft for the National Basketball League, and he was going to, he was declared to go in the draft, and he had some expectations, the scouts had uh, put it in his mind that he was going to be pretty high up in the draft, and as the draft progressed, uh, he had had some injuries and an off year, and he ended up falling out of the draft. The draft came to an end, and he wasn't drafted, he was undrafted. And I remember that night, all the expectation and the hope and all the, you know, his direction of his life had been pointed towards this day. And I remember he posted this thing in his, on his um, social media and it just says, adversity introduces a man to himself. Right? It's who we are when we face hardship. That's how we know who we really are. And so we grow through resistance and we grow through adversity. There's some things that you need to overcome in order to become the person that God has destined you to be. He wants to grow you through these things. But here's the truth. Whether you understand the reason for the hardship or whether you understand how you're going to grow through the hardship, maybe you don't even see. I don't don't even understand. This hardship seems senseless to me. This is what I want you to know. Explanations don't give you peace. Right? I could explain to you the reason for things, and you might still say that doesn't seem like a good enough explanation. You might say, I hear what you're saying, but I don't know if it's worth going through what I went through in order to get to that end result, right? Sometimes the explanation, even just knowing, still doesn't bring us peace, and it's not meant to. Because Jesus has a second truth here in overcoming hardship. He says that we can take heart because we are not alone. Look at verse 33. The source of peace isn't in understanding our circumstances. The source of peace isn't knowing the reasons behind our hardship. The source of peace is in the fact that we're not alone. Jesus said, I told you all this so that you might have peace in me. Here on earth you'll have many trials and sorrows, but take heart. I've overcome 
the world. There's a pretty famous quote by the old preacher, Charles Spurgeon, and I remember just the moment I heard that quote, it just kind of grabbed a hold of my heart. It was so meaningful to me, and it said this. It says, I have, kissed, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. Not a big journaler, but I remember in this period of time when I first read this, I, I wrote this down in my journal. In every storm of life, there's opportunity to be disoriented, disillusioned, and overwhelmed, and overcome. But there's also opportunity to be drawn back to intimate dependence on the immovable one, our rock, our Jesus. Kiss the waves. See, friends, peace isn't found in understanding our hardship. Peace is found in understanding that in the midst of every hardship, you're not alone. Jesus overcame so we can overcome. I love the rendering of this text. It says, take heart. Take heart. Jesus is saying, be bold. Be of courageous faith. Be of strong determination. Be at peace. This is so much more than a pep talk. See, Jesus is readying his followers for the most difficult days of their life. They're about to uh, witness him be arrested, mocked, beaten, They're about to witness him be tried and unjustly sentenced to die. They're about to witness him be hung on the cross, taken down and buried in the tomb. And all of this would have them questioning their faith, searching for purpose, scrambling for meaning, desperate for peace. Imagine how disorienting all of this was. They didn't know what you and I know today, right? They, they didn't know, but, but they were about to discover what we know it was truth number three, is that you can take heart because this is not the end. This is not the end. In his book, Good to Great, author Jim Collins tells a story of a Vietnam War veteran, and, and he's a prisoner of war, Admiral James Stockdale. In September 1965, James Stockdale was flying a mission over northern Vietnam. And uh, he was flying, and as his plane was struck by enemy fire, he ejected and parachuted to safety in a small village below, only to be captured by the Vietnamese. And while he was there, he was beaten and taken prisoner. And for the next seven and a half years of his life, he found himself a prisoner of war, living in what has infamously been called the Hanoi Hilton Prisoner of War Camp. As a senior naval officer, Stockdale was routinely tortured. He was deprived of medical treatment, and he spent day after day in a windowless concrete cell, only three feet wide by nine feet long. Day after day in this place. How do you survive circumstances like that for seven and a half years? Upon his release and escape, or his, his uh, freedom, uh, author Jim Collins asked him, how did you endure this? And this is what Stockdale said. He said, I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that I would get out of it, but that I would also prevail in the end and turn the experience into the defining event of my life. That's what he said. Hope is never losing faith in the end of the story. We see that repeated in scripture. Paul says in Philippians 1, I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it's fully finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. You can have hope today because this isn't the end. See, as Jesus sat with his friends preparing them for hardship and the suffering that they were to endure, the disciples have no way of knowing what we know. In just a few days, they would witness what would certainly seem like the end of all they believed in. It would look like the end of all that they had given their lives to. It would look like the end of what they were hoping for and even the end of hope itself. But what they couldn't know that we know now is that it was not the end. That in just a few short days, Jesus' words were about to take on whole new meaning for them. I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you'll have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. That's right. See, no matter your hardship, Jesus reigns over it. Right? Jesus is in the midst of it. Jesus can do something through it. 
And Jesus wants to bring hope to you out of it. Jesus overcame so you can overcome. Would you stand with me all across this room this morning? We're going to sing this song that the church has been singing for generations. And it simply says this, it is well with my soul. Let's sing this together.
that old promise, Lord, that you are with us through everything. Now, I realize some of us are in this place of saying this as a faith declaration because it doesn't feel well right now. Some of us are going through some things right now, and it's, it's hard. And right now, I just love with every head bowed and every eye closed in this place. If you would just right now and say, you know what, Pastor Jared, I I'm singing it. I believe it, but I don't feel it. Or it's hard to feel it. It's hard to believe it right now. But would you just pray for me? I want to hold on. I I'm holding. I'm on the edge of what I can do in my own strength. I'm on the edge of my faith. I'm on the edge of my courage. Would you lift me up in prayer? Anyone this morning, would you just raise your hand and say, would you pray for me? I'm in that place. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. All across this room. Amen. People of different backgrounds, different stories, coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I need that hope. I need that courage. I need that strength. Lord, I pray for my friends today. Lord, in the midst of what they're going through, God, would you show yourself faithful? Lord, would you show yourself faithful, Lord God, that you are there. Maybe, Lord, maybe they don't know you yet as their Lord and Savior. Maybe you're here and you're like, I'm understanding what you're saying, Jer, but I don't have a relationship with Jesus yet. Today would be the best day to start that relationship. The Bible talks about repentance. Repentance means turning your mind and also turning your life, reorienting the direction, turning away from leading yourself. That's what sin is, essentially. Leading your life apart from God. And we're gonna turn from that and we're gonna turn towards following God and saying, God, I wanna follow your plan and purpose and your design for my life. Maybe you're here and say, Pastor Jerry, I've never made that decision, but today I wanna give my life to Jesus and follow his plan and purpose for my life. Is there anyone in this room who say, that's me today, making that decision to follow Jesus for the first time or the first time in a long time? Yes, thank you at the back. Amen. Anyone else today? Yes, amen. It's always a great decision. Just make that choice. And so, Jesus, I pray for each of us in this place that we would have overwhelming confidence that you overcame hardship, that you overcame sin, that you overcame this world so that we could overcome in you and through you. We're overcomers. We don't do it in our own strength. We don't do it in our own plans and purposes. We do it by being in you. So for those that are making that decision to be in you today, for us that are choosing again, I think this is an everyday decision to be in you. Lord, let us have that confident peace, courage, and strength that we can overcome. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, it's been great to be with you in church this morning. The prayer team are going to come. They're going to be right here at the front. If you love someone to pray with you, they're going to be here. As everyone else is leaving, would you just come forward and let them pray with you today? Take care and God bless. We'll see you next week.